So, Berto, this is chapter two in yes. which we review our own memories, the timeline, my outline here of the events that led up to and through and after well, not after the pandemic, because it's arguable that we're, we're still in it, <laughs> still in the pandemic. And I'll get to that later in terms of what defines a pandemic. But this is chapter two. So let's let's continue where we left off. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirkana. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I uh, grow carbonated avocados. So February 28th, we're post Seattle Dragons game XFL. By the way, little wrap up on that. The XFL did not survive the pandemic. No. <laughs> there, had, there had only been five games over five oh, weeks. Man. But The Rock, Dwayne Johnson uh-huh. and his ex-wife actually bought XFL. Even Oh, because, really? And, and are starting next month, February. Wait, really? They're bringing it back? Yeah. And okay. they also allocated a team for Seattle, but because Seattle Dragons, but Dragons, I was like, okay, you know, I can see because we're also nerds and you know, Wizard of the Coast, Seattle right. thing. I thought, okay, I can get behind Seattle Dragons, but they changed the name Uh-oh. to Sea Dragons. Well, okay, no, 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 no. See, I like it because, you know, Seattle, Sea Dragons, I like it. All right, so February 28th, this is pre lockdown. I am still in a place where I'm thinking everything's fine, everything's gonna be okay. You're by this point, it's over for me. Like I'm seriously like I'm. I just dodged the Disney bullet. I am now actually considering not going to work. I, I'm literally thinking I might not want to go into work, but they haven't told us to stay home yet. So I'm like still going at this point to was the office. was the Life Center by at, you know the Kirkland Life Center. This is where it started. Was it? Was it late? Um, yeah, it was February? late February. So there were news reports of, and this is in my neighborhood, blocks from where I live. Right. So a perfect storm for you. You're already prepared, and now the virus and is I'm, literally just down the street from you. Right. And I'm thinking because I am actually. So if you don't know, just to let the listeners in, the in the the news story not only in Seattle and Washington but also in the nation was that. Seattle was where the virus was only. Yes. Now, it wasn't necessarily only there, but that's where it was being talked about. And not only was it this, this Seattle area, which was actually north of Seattle, about you know an hour north of Seattle in Everett area, but the big outbreak was mm-hmm. just blocks down the street from Berto's house yeah. in Kirkland at a, at old a, folks at a retirement home. Yeah. And uh, so... So that was the big story. This is a a place where it's it's not just retirement. They they take care of elderly that have health issues. So it's it's really like the worst case scenario. Elderly people with pre-existing conditions all together in a place that's not ready or prepared for this at all. They get hit. It's the middle of winter. It's not being ventilated. I know. And they get hit so hard. They start dropping like dead. Mm -hmm. And now i am thinking oh no not like the worst i thought is actually upon me this is the zombie apocalypse. oh wait actually i skipped ahead berto can i yeah, yeah interrupt you we'll get there in a second so my outline was a bit effed um okay february 19 okay rewind the clock i'm back from disney wee-dee, wee-dee, wee-dee. i'm back from disney and i'm going <gasps> whoo <laughs> yeah dodge the bullet although actually i didn't know enough to know that i didn't know if i had dodged the bullet because right. i might not find out for like five days yeah <laughs> so february 19th yeah you're back from anaheim yeah you come over to my house and we record an episode on right. health on health anxiety that's right yes i had been prepping this episode for months yeah it just randomly coincided with the very beginning. Right. Of, and we were going to talk about me having been sick in January. You haven't been sick at Mardi Gras. Right. Yeah. No, no, I wasn't. I, this is before Mardi Gras. This is oh. before Mardi Gras. The Mardi Gras, I left the next, okay. the next couple of days. Okay. We, we both have health. We were going to talk about right. your general hypochondria, okay. my milder, but still their hypochondria. Yeah. We we're going to talk about when you were flossing and you thought you had right. a tapeworm. <laughs> we we're going to talk about how you will various times have, you know, uh, uh, right. aluminum foil hat. And so we talked about it. Incidentally, coincidentally, th- this episode on February 19th was the last time we even saw each other in person. That's right. For 16 months. Oh my God, that's right. 
I so, didn't even think about that. So it's this weird wow. coincidence because again, I it wasn't like oh, there's this coronavirus. I'll do an episode on health anxiety. No. I've been prepping it for months. And during the episode, Berto. Yeah, you brought up COVID. No, you, I brought. I, well, yeah, I brought yeah. exactly. I brought up the novel coronavirus. But you were actually addressing it as in. Well, this is one of those cases where people like us with anxiety could get extra worked up right. because the media like makes a big deal of these things. <laughs> right. Well, I was even being a little more obtuse. I was railing, not terribly, but against the panic that was happening in the media because I, I, mean, I was comparing I, it to Ebola. I, 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 okay. I wouldn't say, knowing what I know now, I still wouldn't say you were being extra obtuse because I, I do think that the people that were failing us weren't the media, it wasn't us. It was, like we already said, there were very informed scientists that, that were in a position to talk to people that should have been in a position to, to lay down some rules. Yeah. We are not those people. No, yeah, no, I don't blame myself. <laughs> yeah. But, so we record the episode and it's it's still up and it's a, I, I find it to be a great episode and it's also interestingly situated in time it was one of those times where i had a bunch of episodes and recorded already and thus after i edited it and prepared mm -hmm. it for publication it wasn't slated to be published for a couple of weeks right during those couple of weeks yeah i went from the coronavirus is no big deal right to holy shit this could be a thing right. and so i actually went back to the editing yeah. room and actually took out muted that out that entire section where I'm where I'm basically saying the classic idiot things that eventually would be parroted by Republicans for the next year, which is it's just like the flu, it's no right. big deal. Well, I don't know if you remember uh, because I, because I don't know if you reheard it, but because I was I was sort of in a weird spot there because I didn't want to put on my tinfoil hat. Yeah, okay, I so this is your you know, Berto. There are times when I feel like I can't trust you entirely because I understand why. Because people, I would say that I would describe you as someone who's pretty honest, but you hold your cards pretty close to your chest. Like when we had our 12th or 13th, I think yeah. the 12th anniversary, and you were really going through a horrible health issue, 13th or something, you didn't tell me you didn't even i overheard you a year later talking to stacy saying about how miserable yeah. you were that day but but if you hear that audio again though like i this is something we could do we should do is i actually said and i, I don't exactly remember but i said something along the lines of like i'm not sure this one's gonna be the same kind of thing okay but i was i was in this i, I didn't want to come out on on the podcast and be like dude we're all doomed. We're going into lockdown. This but, is but it. But think about how interesting it would have been if you <laughs> yeah, had. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're supposed to be the honest, off the cuff, yeah. But I was trying. I mean, I guy. was trying. We actually had a moment where, if I don't remember. But I, Did I, you re-listen to it recently or something? No, I just remember in the moment. Oh. I, it, like, that was a big, prominent moment in my head. Yeah. So I didn't even know was that was small, happening. I wouldn't call it a debate because we didn't rat hole too long because you actually just wanted to keep moving. Yeah. But there was a moment where I was trying to like, like say, well, no, because like normally flu is this and that. And then, and then we just kind of like kept going. But I was like, uh, uh, inside I was like, oh, I wonder if I should, but I, well, it probably know. wouldn't have gone over well with me at the time no, no, because no. it, the data was from this extremely right. dubious source. Right. You know? And I would have said like, well, you would have said like, how do you know this? I'm like, well, I watched this YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why I knew, I like, I knew that I didn't have like the credentials because that was the other thing. This is one of the things I was so pissed off about. I didn't know shit. So I was sitting there going like, if I can piece this together, not knowing anything with these dubious sources, why the fudge are people in yeah. better positions of power not doing this? So I, I, I listened to a podcast called Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Yeah. In fact, for those, I've said this before, that Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, if you're familiar with the podcast, was a major influence on me even starting a podcast 14 years ago. I do Tougher Bluffs. That's a direct ripoff from their most long-standing popular segment called Science or Fiction. And I also modeled myself after the podcast in that you have a central professional, Dr. Stephen Novella, who is a physician yeah. and a professor. And he has his best friends and his brothers who are 
with him on the podcast together. Right. That's what I did in the beginning. You know, I, I'm the central professional and then I have friends that yeah. are loud mouths, you know, <laughs> you and Lita in the beginning. And um, so I've been listening to them for 16, 17 years religiously. I come up with an episode every Saturday. It, you know, it, it, it's, I think, uh, less entertaining to me now than it was before. But it was in 2007 when there was so little out there, this was like a really big deal in my life. And yeah. so during the pandemic, Dr. Stephen Novella, he's one of those people that prides himself in knowing everything about everything, yeah, but yeah. particularly around medical science, which it's his, it's his, and he's also a professor at Yale. Okay. And is in charge of teaching people and also the internet on the, I think he's mildly obsessive, similar to me in, in this way. But since it's his wheelhouse, he would every week update on the newest research and outlook yeah, yeah. about the virus. And so I was throughout this whole time, pretty much just adopting Dr. Stephen Novella's perspective. Yeah. And he, at this time, was not saying things that you would have said. Yeah. He, he was saying, well, we don't know. It, it looks like it could be bad. There could be maybe 100, maybe 200,000 deaths in the United States, but there's no reason to panic yet because just we don't know. And there's not a lot of reason to panic, but it, it could be bad, but it also could just be another Ebola scare. We don't know. And obviously they were going over all the science, the r not science, and there just wasn't much data yet. That's the other thing that I, I want people to yeah. remember is that at this moment, we did not really know anything about, we knew very little about the virus. There were, spe, you know, you could have speculations based on anecdote, but science doesn't work that way. You need all the data. Yep. You need to, and it's not like you can put a scanner on the world and say, oh, that virus was trans, transmitted through the air. The reason why we know the virus is transmitted through the air is through circumstantial evidence. We can't measure the virus yeah. traveling through the air. I mean, you can measure vi viral load on droplets and stuff, but you can't really know if it's enough to, in to get into someone's body. What we do is we go, well, that person we have, we now know had the virus for the past week. They were in a small room with five other people for two and a half hours, and all of them also got the virus. You have another person over here who also had the virus, and they were outside with five people, and only one person got the virus. And you cobble together literally millions of data points along those lines, and you say, oh, clearly, if you're in a small room, you are more likely to get it, and thus the, the and strong see, hypothesis is that it's transmitted through the air. That That's how we piece together the reality of this right. virus, and at the time, we had none of that data. So the, the reason that the videos that were, that had an effect on me, is because the dude, instead of what I not only think his normal content is, because later I kept following that channel, and then later on I started realizing, oh, wait a minute, because there was this whole other bent to the channel, and it's really about like uh, Illuminati conspiracies and all this other kind of stuff. <laughs> but, but the way that those videos were presented, he was actually going over like, okay, here's, here's the information we have from this case reported. So this person was in a meeting, in, in Paris and then they left and then the following patients showed up and, the, and they were like, it took three days for incubation and then they showed the graphs. Here's what the SARS one did. Here's what this one is doing. So it looks like the curve is faster. So I was sitting there like, like you know, I'm, I'm interested in science going, okay, that doesn't sound good. Yeah. Again, I was like, well, Maybe this is all full of shit, but he wasn't like randomly saying like, but, I've, I've seen the signs on the tea leaves. But you still went to Disneyland. But I still went to Disneyland. And risked your wife and your kids. That's right. That's right. So you obviously weren't. And, and like I said. You weren't 51% sure. You know what I mean? No, it's worse than that. I actually was like 60% sure. And yet I took the risks. Why? Because I felt so dumb canceling a Disney trip. That's interesting. Yeah, and I felt and you're a very strong person. Normally, yes. So, so but you know, never so in I, our lives had we encountered something. like Yeah, this. but that's interesting because I think that that also points to another psychological phenomenon, yeah. which is that when it's such a novel experience, no one wants to be that person who sticks no. their neck out, even though they're sixty percent sure, even though 
death is literally on the line like, of, of your children, Birdo. Like, do you know they interviewed me, uh, the, the local news channel interviewed me coming out of Whole Foods at, towards the end of February? No. Right when people were starting to go and buy a lot of stuff, I had already done that. We had already bought extra stuff, so I wasn't in a run. What'd you, what'd you extra buy? Well, we bought you know some toilet paper. We bought some extra food. We had extra water. Like how much toilet that. paper did you buy? We did not buy, go crazy, oh, okay. but we bought like you know some extra, like a couple extra packages or something. But this was like, I think it was like. How did you know to buy extra toilet paper? Because that's the first time we've had a run on toilet paper because because in it our wasn't society. just toilet paper. I went to Whole Foods. You just bought and a did bunch like of everything. A lot of everything. Okay. It was later that month so canned food. when everyone freaked out and then all of a sudden there was no toilet paper. Yeah. But I was going to Whole Foods just to buy some extra stuff. Coming out of Whole Foods, they interviewed me, you know, just like local news interviewed me. And like, what do you think of all this stuff? And this is now at the point where, so I don't remember the exact date, but definitely the lockdowns weren't in place yet, but they, they, we knew about the old folks home. Yeah, so let People me get to that. So let me get to, we're, almost, oh, yeah, yeah, right. we're almost there. So, so you and I record this episode. We don't know what at the time, but it's the last time we'll see each other in person for 16 months. We'll record podcasts over Zoom. Then I go to New Orleans two days later. To, oh, yeah, which is crazy. To, I see. I thought you would. I thought that was before that. To Mardi Gras. <laughs> oh my gosh. February 21 to 26, and me and Stacy did it up. We right. we were at the epicenter of the the parades right there on Canal Street. Oh my god. Right, you know the right the our, the parades were right outside our door of of the i don't know the hyatt or something were you so. nervous at all about it no not at all no i, I mean see i like i said i was biting my nails at so i'll tell you when i got nervous it was when i went to tahoe a week later than that yeah yeah but but i still wasn't ter. well no i was nervous by then but so new orleans so again it, it sounds bizarre and i'm I'm a scaredy cat when it comes to viruses. But yeah. because, and again, I'm listening to Dr. Stephen Novella yeah. weekly give me updates, and it's totally in their wheelhouse. In fact, I'd, I, I should go back and listen to those episodes, you know, because they have them still up. That the way he was talking, it was like, well, there's no reason to panic now, and there's no reason to take action now, but you might have to do something soon. At least that was the impression I got, you know? And so I just, you know, went along and. The precedent had already been set by Ebola, by H1N1, yeah. that the whoever figures this shit out, they'll figure it out. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. whatever needs to happen, it'll happen, and and it'll just be a, a, a worry that happens, and, and it goes away. Because that's always what happens. So, plus, I'm moving away from Seattle. I'm going to yeah. Louisiana. This is far away. This is, yeah, yeah. you know, a thousand miles from from viruses from, yeah. don't travel that far <laughs> yeah so now it would later come to be known that mardi gras was the super transmission event in the in the world oh really yeah oh no the, the data is hard to really cobble oh it together gosh. but like one of the data points is that when they ran tests yeah. on a sampling of people a week later in new orleans who had covid the strain the exact exact because you know the we have variants but even There's within even yeah. within a variant there are several sub variants yeah, yeah. and the like right now there's a sub variant called the kraken which is scaring people is there really one yeah called the there's kraken? one called the kraken which is um apparently even more transmissible than omicron but not necessarily it's not worse in terms of symptoms or anything. Yeah. And I remember Stephen Novella talking about that too. It's that, that typically with viruses, when you gain one strength as a virus like transmissibility, you lose killability. Yeah. <laughs> and anyone who plays the game pandemic knows all these different things. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I learned about pandemics. Yeah. Pandemic. Uh, which I've never played, by the way. I did play. I, I actually, a few years ago, I was quite addicted to it on my phone. Yeah. I've, yeah. It's always been a game that, has been suggested to me on Steam, but for whatever reason, I don't. So when they look at the different strains in different cities in 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 around the world, New Orleans in that month post Mardi Gras, almost everyone had the exact oh same gosh. strain, which suggests that it was same origin. It was the same origin, meaning oh. that one, you know, a, a, one a, a small group, yeah, from Seattle, maybe brought it down to Mardi. Now, I went to the hospital, yeah, with massive symptoms of a skin rash, yeah, 
there were some small cases reported, you know, a few yeah. cases reported of because, you know, the COVID symptoms are varied. Some yeah, people have no symptoms. Some people have the classic ones. Some people lose their smell. Some people don't. Yeah. And there were some cases, apparently, of people developing a skin rash yeah. because they got COVID. So, it, you know, I never had the antibody tests. Yeah. So it's possible. It doesn't seem likely because Stacy. I guess Stacy also could have gotten it. And but anyway, the point is, is that go to Mardi Gras, and the whole time, all I'm doing is packed together yeah. with millions of people. Yeah, Bourbon Street. I, I did it up. You I did the whole thing. I, I went. I went to Bourbon Street several times. I went into several clubs. I have a friend that goes there every year because his wife is a part of old. Louisiana, old New Orleans, old Mardi Gras. They're in the parade, one of the parades. They do the whole wow. costume thing. And and it's this, it goes back like a hundred years to this old wow. sort of fraternal system, yeah. super racist, by the way. Ugh. And so, yeah, I was just packed together, all these people, obviously the airport, no masks, no, yeah. you know, but I'm, I'm fairly hand washy and, <laughs> right. and, but obviously breathing in everyone's. Yeah, yeah everyone's there so i get back and then february 28th a high school student at henry 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 m jackson high school in mill creek which is up mm -hmm. near everett snohomish is confirmed as having the virus and the school closes immediately so this yeah. is the the first time an institution yeah. i think in the united states had you, you had the life center in kirkland that was already having some right. issues but this is a whole entire high school with probably two thousand students and staff and parents all complete shutdown by the way at this point i am very frustrated because uh the schools in my area are not shutting down so this is because now is now late february i've now passed like if we had recorded our podcast at this point the whole podcast i would have been like the world is about to end yeah and by then i probably would have <laughs> right. been like maybe so at this point i am irate i am going and this is something i actually really deeply regret um, that Life Center place, uh, I actually posted on our neighborly Facebook thing. I post, I made a post. Have you taken screenshots of this? Uh, I, you should, I can you go should, back and do it. You should find it because yeah. this is an historical document. The yeah. one. But I'm very embarrassed of this one because I, I made a post about the Life Center. But you're that one person yeah. who is actually, yeah. you know, you're that person. And you on should the, have seen the replies. On the corner I who's got, like screaming. I yeah. got lambasted, yes. But I, I made one post about Life Center and I was railing against the administration of that place really hard. Because I was saying, like, this is unacceptable. They should have seen the sign. Like, I was, I was really standing on my, on my soapbox. And well, was it found that they were irresponsible? Well, because you could argue it, the, the naivete the, was was understandable. That's the, the reason I would say, like, that's why eventually I was like, I was being too harsh, because knowing Plus now, we don't know. Ex do we know exactly what they did? step by step no it's just what i'm realizing is that man and just word to the wise if you have an old folk in an old folks home go and inspect it yourself like really take a tour and look because they they actually don't have they didn't have any provisions for an eventuality like this and so they were so unprepared but as a lot of places were but that's the thing it wasn't just them and and but i was so upset at the time i'm like because now for a month I've been stewing on this and now it's the end of February so I'm like everyone should know this now so I was upset at the school districts I was upset that they hadn't sent us home from work yet I was I was like god damn yeah I mean so if you would have said that to me at the time at this I, point you probably would have started going like yeah. I, mean, I probably would have been like yeah. well it's reasonable but, well, I, but I still wouldn't have I still wouldn't have gone along with it, it yeah. that, that's what's so weird about the, these few weeks is that the mindset and the perspective was so drastically different from day to day, which, yes. we'll, which we'll get into. And by the way, that's when they interview me. So it's right around the end of February. Okay. And what do they, what they, what they, what so, do you say? So, you know, like, hey, hi, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what are you going through your mind? What do you think about COVID, blah, blah. And I... Were they, they, were they calling it COVID? They're probably calling it uh, whatever, coronavirus. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, it took a while to get rid of the coronavirus, of coronavirus. label. You know. What do you think of the thing? And so I said... Uh, yeah, no, I, I said, no, it's it's serious. It's it's going to be hard. Uh, I'm out here. It's like, are you loading up and stuff? It's like, no, I already did that. I We have provisions, but 
um, yeah, I think it's it's going to be very difficult. So at the time, was there kind of a run at the supermarket? Uh, that was the, when all those news, yeah, or the news about people doing runs. But it wasn't, like, I think it was a week later when everything ran out. Yeah. Yeah. So at, the, at this time, it wasn't like people running in and out of the place. And, and it was, no one was wearing masks yet. I think I was not wearing a mask yet. And they were interviewing me. Uh, they aired it that night. I, my mom got a call from a friend of hers. Your son's on the news. But they cut out the, the parts where I was saying, oh, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> they just had me going like, oh, well, you know, uh, I think we got to, you know, come together as a community. And, and really, uh, I think we can probably pull through this, you know. That's mm-hmm. what I was saying. But I had also said, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> and they cut that out. <laughs> Funny. So it makes it look like you're all optimistic. I, I sounded very optimistic. But you weren't optimistic. Well, I was optimistic. Well, like you, I was thinking, I mean, the government's going to kick in any minute now. Yeah. I was, at the same time, I was a little worried about who was in charge. But I was thinking, well, but that's at the at the president level. Yeah. What about all the local governments? Like, yeah. We things have, are going to kick in. We have, we have often Democratic mayors, yeah. governors. So that's why I was worried. I, I thought, you yeah, know, stuff's going to get bad. At the same time, I was thinking, but, you know, we'll... We'll pull through this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but but you're like, it's going to be bad. Yeah. But everything. And I fun. was definitely, I was like, because people were still like, oh, we don't know if we're going to shut down. I'm like, oh, there's going to be shutdowns. <laughs> yeah. And, and for people, just fast forward to the story. Berto and I never got it. As far as I know, I've never tested positive. I don't think, I think there's a good chance. I would give it a 80% chance that you and I literally never got never it. Never got it. Because Could be. the times where it was possible that we did there's there's no other infections around us. Do you know the, what I mean? The only thing that I still can't explain, but it, so you know, in that in that January twenty seventh of twenty twenty, I got really sick, and that's when I went to the ER. Remember, that's the time. Yeah, but you I, were also it was kind of a classic episode of your thyroid problem, but right? I didn't know at the time, and yes, it is likely. But they ran thyroid tests at the time. But they did that other times too, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. So, so, I mean, it, to me, it, it's possible for it's sure. It's possible, but who knows? But also the fact that you didn't live in Everett. Do you know what I mean? Like, But it was down the street from the other epicenter. Yeah. But and I'm guessing that a, a worker from Everett works yeah. in the Life Center and they, they brought it. Because it was pretty yeah. localized with how transmissible yeah. it was and how well, literally no one was we'll, taking we'll, any precautions. Not only will you and I never know, the hospital didn't know what I had. My doctor to this day thinks it could have been, but doesn't know. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, when I asked the doctors, including my endocrinologist, do you think that was my thyroid? They looked at the numbers and they said, probably not. But they said that at other times too. <sighs> because your, cause your thyroid would fluctuate so fast, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing is, if we did, you and I have yeah. COVID, our symptoms were so different, strange, so strange, <laughs> yeah. So strange. Like it, like yeah. if we had a classic, even just one of the classic yeah. symptoms, then we could raise the a- possibility higher. Absolutely. As an example, I had shivers for days, but mm. no fever. Okay. No fever. But you also had no cough. I had and, zero and, cough. And 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 uh, I had difficulty breathing. Oh, you did, but not cough. But you did have difficulty breathing. But difficulty breathing, but not like, <gasps> and my oxygenation wasn't low. Oh, okay. But it was just, this Fati- is why. Fatigue. I was extremely fatigued. Well, you're more in the direction than I was. I mean, you I had a rash that a, was. And I had yeah. a giant po' boy yeah. sandwich filled to the brim with crawdads. Crawdads. With, with crave, yeah. in Seattle, we call them crawdads, yeah. which apparently is sacrilegious to call them that in New Orleans. Okay. Um, so I just keep saying crawdads because that's what we said growing up. Because <laughs> we would literally go to the the creek and yeah, and, get and, <laughs> and, and and capture crawdads. And I also was tested for an allergy to crawdads and shrimp and lobsters because yeah. they're, they're bugs of the sea, and was found to have an yeah. allergy. So for me, it's I, quite likely. Yeah, it seems extremely. And again, mine did. Yes, I had this and that and the other, but at the same time, I didn't have like the most common was sore throat, fever, and a cough. Right. And I didn't have either of those. Right. If you were asymptomatic completely, and I guess you wouldn't know, Yeah. <laughs> then I would consider that, because if you had some symptoms that are definitely explainable by the thyroid thing, I don't yes. know, it just seems... And they, and, they, and they can be. Yeah. And then all the other colds I had, which I didn't have many during the pandemic, I, I never tested positive any of those times. Yeah. So as far as I know, 
You and I haven't. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, yeah. I would put money down. I mean, there's no way to know. Only, My wife had it. Only she the universe had it. Yeah. <laughs> Which she we'll isolated. Yeah, yeah. So let's take a break. When we get back, yeah. let's, let's almost get to March. What do you say? Let's do it. So to finish off my notes from late February, I have, Cal- so we have the closure of the high school north of Seattle. We have the Life Center in Kirkland. Seven of the nation's first nine COVID, COVID deaths are going to be linked to the Life Center in Kirkland. Uh, you have, uh, so pretty scary situation just down the street from you. H- how how yeah. far is it from your house? Like a half mile-ish? I don't want to say. Oh, right. Because I don't want to be that specific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we have late February, uh, around the same time. California health authorities have also confirmed that two people in the in California died from the coronavirus before the United States reported its first death in late February of 2020. Yeah. So now all of a sudden you have panic buying of masks, hand sanitizer, and toilet paper. Yeah. Um, which you apparently had uh, beaten. I had not. Stacy and I. Were you guys out there trying to score some paper? No, <laughs> I didn't bother. Okay. One with. I just waited. It didn't even occur to Stacy and I to hoard. We just, it just didn't cross our minds. So, you know, we had a supply of toilet paper right. that ran out maybe a month into the lockdown. Trying to find toilet paper at that time was rough. Right. And I remember we managed to get, if I remember right, some, like just four rolls mm-hmm. we got from Amazon from like this random <laughs> seller. Yeah. And there was this really weird off brand of toilet paper <laughs> that we got. Oh my God. I actually took a picture of it because I'm like, my God, we actually. And I don't know if we ever ran out, ran out, but I think we're close. Okay. So wow. March. Now, I'm teaching at the university in person, of course. I'm teaching at least two classes, and I'm seeing all my clients in person. March 1, I uh, am, we're about to go to Tahoe. At this point, I'm starting to worry because I remember March 1, my friends wanted to meet up because I was going with my friends broadhead and file and glover and we were going to we're going to march (laughs) we're going to tahoe to ski we had this planned a a long time ago and we were meeting up for dinner on that friday march one and uh to just talk about you know preparing to go and we we went to a restaurant down the street and i remember going into the restaurant it's pretty crowded and i remember being uptight about it and no one else seemed to be uptight about it yeah there was a little bit of talk of coronavirus but no one seemed to be internalizing it at all. I was. Our waitress was sniffling. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> which made oh, no. me extremely uncomfortable. Right. And, uh, but I, I didn't do anything. You know, I yeah. still I still ate, the, I still sat in that See, booth. it's the same mental gymnastics that, because yeah. you, you were asking me, you know, why did I still, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know. But I wasn't, I didn't know what you knew. At this sure, point. but. I, but I, and I, and I'm, and I, but I, this is always. But listen, you are cautious. Yeah. You do know about transmissible disease. And by this time, we're talking about early March. And yet you. Yeah. Sat there. Yeah. And you were like, okay, I'll just deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm, maybe this is another sociological phenomenon, which is that you and I are always the weirdos when it comes yeah. to health anxiety. We're always the ones who are like, um, I'm not comfortable with this. That's right. And nothing bad ever happens whether we take the precaution or not. We've yeah. had a lifetime or yeah. however many decades <laughs> yeah. of being that worried weirdo. Like, don't eat it out off the floor. Ah, oh, you ate it. Even though even though we're not uh, wrong yeah. in our uh, perspective, we're overly, or you would say on, this, on the range of caution, we're at one end of the spectrum. Right. So... I was used to being in that zone, and if, if as a rule, whenever I felt uncomfortable, I shut the whole thing down. I would, I, you know, seventy five percent of the things that I do would be canceled, right? And right. I would have no friends, right? So it was a very comfortable place for me to be. Of just like, well, Kirk, you're always the one that's freaking out. Uh, I'm oh. sure, every, every, and I, and another thing is, even though I consider myself to be a smart person, I also am not beyond normal human folly which is to incorporate the crowd's mentality into my mentality no one was doing anything and and especially in that restaurant and again we're talking liberal democrat people 
who are concerned with such things. Well, at, at this moment, there wasn't yet any politicization. Poli- yeah, yeah. So I'm in this restaurant. The waitress is sniffling, maybe even sneezing. <laughs> no one's blinking an eye at it. Oh my god! Uh, my friends aren't doing anything, and so I'm just like, well. I guess I'll just follow suit and just not also not do anything. Yeah. So I remember that. So that's the first time when I remember really thinking, I don't feel comfortable. Okay. The first cases show up in Rhode Island, Florida, New York are confirmed. So March 1, already it's all around the United States. Yeah. And everyone knows at this point, these are just the ones we're catching. Right. Um, right. The second, so the, the illusion of like, well, I mean, it's only in China and I guess in Seattle is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So I said earlier that seven of the nation's first nine COVID deaths were at Life Care Center in Kirkland. But on March 1, the second person of those seven died. Okay. Okay. So we hadn't yet had all those seven deaths. Right. And by the way, wasn't Italy now under... No. It, oh, not yet. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. March 2nd. So this is when it gets real micro. Yeah. Okay, March 2nd is the last day that I saw clients and supervisees in person. That's Monday. Uh-huh. Oh, so March 1 was a Sunday. Yeah. March 3rd, and I didn't know that'd be the last day right. I'd see my clients and supervisees right. in person. March 3rd, Tuesday, nine total deaths in Washington. So you have two at, at the Life Center Life in Kirkland, Center. and you have seven at other places. Right. March 4, Wednesday, is my last in-person class. Again, I don't, I don't know that that's right. the last time. Fast forwarding, I did have a one-off in-person class in June outside at Carkeek Park and did not feel comfortable. We all wore masks and sat six feet apart from each other. Okay. You know, this is June of 2020, yeah. so it's still a yeah. problem, right? Um, and it was nice to see everyone in person, but at the same time, I was like, I don't know if it was worth the anxiety. <laughs> and then in June of 2021, after we're all vaccinated, because Antioch yeah. students tend to get vaccinated, we also met in person on campus. That That's kind of a one-off thing because that was kind of like my retirement class that oh I taught. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but anyway, so businesses start shifting to working from home, I think is yeah. an option at this point. The downtown on March 4th starts to kind of become empty. So things That was the last week. That first week of March was the last week I was at the uh at the avocado office. Okay. Yeah. Right. So things are people are starting to really get concerned, but not terribly and prob anyway. So then on Thursday, March 5th through 9th, I go to Tahoe. <laughs> now, I thought, and me and my friends thought, we're getting away from the coronavirus. Yeah. Because it's it's mainly in Seattle. And I don't think I had heard that it was in Rhode Island, Florida, and New York. And of course, that's far from Tahoe. And Tahoe uh, is, anyway, so we go to Tahoe. If you don't know, it's a lake right in between Nevada and California. It's up in the mountains. It's beautiful. Yeah, and you, there's skiing, oh, and so there's beautiful. casinos, and it's like a mini, mini Vegas. And... So I get to the airport, and it, and this is I remember, Berto, I could not find hand sanitizer anywhere anywhere in the airport. The airport that Berto. wasn't a thing yet. No, no, it it was gobbled up. It was oh, all sold I out. I, I, was, I mean, you were trying to buy some, and you couldn't buy any. I was trying to buy it. Oh, it was I all see. sold out. Yeah, yeah. And I managed again. I didn't have any at home yeah. because why? You know, I'm not one of those people yeah. that has hand. It, usually, you find hand sanitizer at work, but you don't have it at home. Right. Yeah. So I thought I'd get some of the airport, and um, I think I, I think I finally found. And I had to run around. I remember I was about to be late for the flight, bec- and again, my friends are just—they don't care at all. Right? What are you doing? I'm trying to get hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah, and at this point, the experts I was uh, adhering to, Dr. Stephen Ovella, these others, it was not a breath virus, transmissible yeah, virus. Yeah. It was wash your hands you know right. it's that whole thing wash your hands for 20 seconds or whatever 50 seconds and so i'm thinking oh, i need hand sanitizer so i finally get some and i remember we arrive in tahoe and we're we're going to a restaurant and i am putting on hands so you know i use my credit card i, I use a pen i sign the receipt at the at the mm-hmm. burger stand i immediately you know put and i'm i'm really worried i remember sitting at this restaurant that march 5th night completely alone no one else cares 
but I'm in this bubble of terror. Oh my God. <laughs> Cause also I'm a week after going to the hospital in new Orleans. Yeah. And so I'm also oh, right. So you're hypersensitive to things right now. And I have not yeah. been to the doctor yet. I don't know. You don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Yeah. So I don't know if I, if I was actually allergic to yeah. the po' boy sandwich. I, I'm thinking, was it something else? And so I'm, I'm pretty scared at this point, you know, but not too right. scared to not go and not too scared to go home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still there, but I remember being pretty, oh pretty, pretty. Oh my pretty gosh. Fun. By the way, the whole, you were saying like, well, at this point, the experts were still just like, wash your hands. That was the other thing that pissed me off because if you will recall, one of the strategies that they must've discussed at the very highest levels, even as early as that was like, ooh, we're gonna run out of masks. So we gotta tell people that masks don't really do anything. <laughs> like that was literally their strategy was to tell people because they wanted masks for hospitals. Right. They, so they literally told people yeah. that masks don't help. I think Fauci was a part of that. Yes. Yeah. And I was, again, the videos, they had science, they had well, data. <laughs> so what they're thinking at that point, and, and, and I, you know, who knows what sort of factors they were bombarded with, but I could see a scenario where smart, because Fauci turned out to be a pretty solid, yeah. smart, science-based person. But I can imagine him sitting in a room with a bunch of people and they're reading all these reports of even crimes occurring as yeah. people are trying to gobble up masks from yeah. stores and stuff. And he's also getting reports from hospitals terrified yeah. that they can't get their hands on masks. Yeah. And so you have uh, you know 300 million people grasping for masks and you have you know 10,000 buyers at different hospitals trying to also, and so, and you have 10,000 against 300 right. million. So you, you have to stop the 300 million people from doing that. And maybe the science was like, well, we don't know if it's transmitted through breath. It, you know, maybe there's some evidence, but you know. But we need them for hospitals. But we need it for hospitals. So, <laughs> so what do we say? Because if we tell the public, look, out of the goodness of your heart, even though it might save your life, please don't buy these. That won't work. And so we have to... Maybe no, you just put a limit. You, you actually make the, the statement publicly at the very highest levels that masks are now a national, like they're nationally controlled. Yeah. Uh, we are calling emergency production into action. Hospitals are top priority and you are limited. So if a store sells yeah. more than N number to people... They get, you know, shut down, whatever the hell, you know, Which, whatever the Which, maybe are. that was even floated, but the infrastructure and the, you know, the system required, I'm guessing, was not in place. Right. I mean, so, by the time we get to the vaccine, which we had a year to, a year plus to prep for, it was clear that our government and our public health system did not have proper leadership. Absolutely, so, because they, they ended up with the worst of both worlds, which was, they said, oh, masks don't help. And yet we still had a shortage of masks and everyone still bought masks. So everyone still bought the masks, but but many people now, even people that would have otherwise maybe been swayed, were like, oh, well, masks don't help. So now no one's wearing them, but they're buying them. Right. Uh, it's like, worst of all, oh, yeah. so frustrating. Yeah, yeah, And, and yeah. by the way, at this point- that, And it's I, also possible that they did have data to suggest that wearing masks was not the priority and that washing your hands was that's the impossible because again now now it's march the data from china was incontrovertible oh was it? masks absolutely helped okay that's where i realized so do you think they like, were lying to try oh, to get yeah. people to a hundred percent wow that was the strategy that they pursued they're like we need now they, in their minds they were like well weighing the options. Well, we need the hospitals to have to, so our strategy is to lie to people. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. I think they discarded that tactic Yeah, because there was a point later on where maybe a year and a half later where, I can't remember what point, but it was like the science made it look as though you didn't have to wear a mask at a certain point or something. Yeah. They said, hey, the data says that you could probably, or no, no, here's what it was. It was, if you are vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And so at the at this, this is like, you know, with the vaccinations being yeah. rolled out, it would be months into the vaccination probably. So they're saying, you know what, you don't have, but if you aren't vaccinated, then you, then you absolutely should wear a mask. And since a lot of the mask wearing culture was supported by 
public humiliation. Yeah. <laughs> the worry was from the liberals was that, well, if you say that to the to the Republicans, they're going to, even though they're not vaccinated, no one knows that because yeah. no, no one has a tattoo on their forehead saying they're vaccinated or not. And they're just going to stop wearing their masks. So right. don't say that to them. Yeah. Don't say <laughs> that if you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask because they're going to stop because we'll stop wearing them maybe and they will too. And I remember a lot of people were saying you should essentially withhold that information, lie by omission. But I was under the principle of, look, I get that. But as soon as you start lying, the whole thing gets thrown out yeah. because we you need to have trust. Yeah. And if, if there's a reason to discount you, then the opposition is going to capitalize on that. So yep. you, you can't do that. And that's the worst because like when, when one side was already saying, they're lying to us, they're lying to us. As soon as like something is wrong, it's like, I see that they, they, they're lying to us. Because they were at they a certain were point. Lying yeah. to us. So as the days progressed in Tahoe, March five to nine, I'm getting more and more worried. By the end of the five days, we go into a restaurant on the final day and I don't eat anything, even, oh, even though I'm starving. You're starving. I don't, because I don't want to touch Now anything. you're really paranoid. Now I'm like, yeah. okay, so I just want to get home, <laughs> yeah. and I want to, oh, and we're in Tahoe, we're in, we're in the casinos and stuff, and no one's from Tahoe, right? None of the, none right, of the customers. The and so there's always this question of where are you from, where are you from? And so we'd be talking to some randoms, and they'd be like, where are you from? And you know, the other people would be like, we're from Illinois or something. And then they'd say, where are you from? Or we'd say, oh, we're from Seattle. And instantly everyone was afraid of us. Oh my God. So at, so at that <laughs> time in, you know, March five through nine, <sighs> the narrative was that the only place in right. the United States that Seattle had the virus was, was Seattle and nowhere else right. did it exist, which was not the case. Wow. So I get on the plane going home. I'm, I'm almost home. The, there's a, a young man sitting next to me, he's probably like 22. On the plane. On the plane, sitting right, he's in the window seat, I'm uh. in the middle seat. He has so much snot. It, no. Oh my God, no. Yeah. Oh no. He's sneezing and coughing. I have, I don't even, I don't have a mask. You don't have a mask. Uh, uh, where am I going to get one of those? I'm sitting there right next to him going, well, this I'm, is it. well I'm dead. Yeah. Like this is the end. Yeah. Like this oh. guy, I've I've never in my life sat. Oh. I mean, maybe I did and didn't notice, but I don't think so. Oh. In my life, I've never sat next to someone that was so more sick. more noticeably and <laughs> snottingly sick. And it's quite possibly they had it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or I mean, least, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna take a guess and say that he that he didn't because yeah. then I would have. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty awful. Um, oh, Tahoe, gosh. by the way, closed down a couple days after, after we got home. Disney closed down one week after we went. Yeah. Because they closed down sooner because they were being a little more cautious. Okay. Actually, so there's a date within the middle of this time, March 6th. So I'm in Tahoe. And in my notes, we've already talked about this bit. Two, yeah, um, so I'm going to read some quotes from Donald Trump. Again, oh, if you want to be a Republican and you just think that small government or second amendment stuff whatever there's a thing about donald trump that is particularly problematic and you don't have to be a genius to understand what that is and i also will be full disclosure and say that there are people in my echo chamber my side of the aisle that i frequently disagree with there's all sorts of democratic things there are pro Wall Street, pro corporation, pro one percent. But that there's I a difference absolutely... between disagreeing with some policies, disagreeing, or even having corruption, right? When when it comes to like, I don't care if the whole system is just crumbled and dissolved, as long as my ego is intact. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're Mussolini. You're you're yeah. you're literally a fascist yeah. dictator at that point, trying to overthrow a obviously uh, well run well enough run election yeah. um so at this point trump has already been told by multiple experts and advisors for several weeks that sars cov 2 was going to be a huge threat during this time and here are some direct quotes from him he says to the public march 6 you have to be calm it'll go away he also says anybody right now and yesterday anybody that needs a test gets a test they're there 
and the tests are beautiful. The tests are perfect, like the letter was perfect. The transcript was he perfect. He literally referenced the letter. It's yeah. just, or the call, right? Like, yeah. what letter, what? To, to Zelensky. Oh, okay, okay. So, and the tests are beautiful. So just listen to this. Oh, God. And, and right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. Caveat, that's 100, that's not 99% true. not, not true. true. They're there and the tests are beautiful. The tests are beautiful? They're what beautiful. The fuck? What are you talking about? They're beautiful. The tests are all perfect like the letter was perfect. He's now jumping <laughs> to talking about a letter that he sent to a politician oh coercing this politician to investigate Joe Biden. Like, because seriously, if, if this is a movie, it, it's like the comedy is so yeah. good. Idiocracy, the it's president so good. was smarter than this. <laughs> um, like, how do you make that jump? Because yeah. I remember he was at the lab. Wasn't he at the lab? What? He, he was uh, it, that that interview that quote. I feel like he was at one of those labs. Maybe and and the, the, he has the scientist standing next to him, and he's like, "The tests are beautiful, and just like the letter." <laughs> yeah, the tests are all perfect, like the letter was perfect. The transcript was perfect, right? This was not as perfect as that, but pretty good. So he says. <laughs> the, so he's saying. <laughs> the the tests are beautiful and perfect, but not as perfect as my letter to Zelensky, which clearly is trying to. Uh, if I I'm ninety five percent sure this is what he's referencing, is he was obviously coercing Zelensky, Ukrainian president, to use his hacking system to try <laughs> to hack into Joe Biden or drum up stories oh about gosh. Hunter Biden, so that. President Trump, and, and he was holding millions of dollars in aid, you know, at bay, saying, I, I only give this money if you actually attack Hunter yeah. Biden so that I can become reelected. Imagine if, if, if you and I, or just people in general, operated this way, where anytime you'll ask me a question about something, I intersperse an answer that's hyperbolic with comments about arguments you and I have had years ago. Yeah. Randomly. <laughs> yeah. Insecure much? He goes on to say another quote. I like this stuff. I really get it. People are surprised that I understand it. Every one of the... So he's talking about science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this stuff. I really get it. People are surprised that I understand it. Every one of these doctors said, how do you know so much about this? They, <laughs> You know, maybe I have a natural ability. Maybe I should have done that instead of running for president. So it's just so incredibly funny. If it weren't so horrible, it would be so funny. Because you have this person so unaware of like the reality of the context. Because again, it was that he was standing there with scientists around him. He's at one of those labs and he's saying these things. And you're like, dude, you are the president. What you're saying right now is so ridiculous. He is the most <laughs> insecure fourth grader in your class. <laughs> it's just so insane. He's sitting there going, instead of like, you know, uh, okay, here's the deal. We are working night and day, and I personally am supervising. Fine, go that way, right? Instead, he's actually like, I've been told by these scientists how amazed they are about my brilliance yeah. about science. Yeah. Wait, what? People are dying. <laughs> Millions will die after this point. And you're talking about how you know everything about science. Yeah. And you clearly don't. This is the figurehead of our nation, the leader of our executive branch, the cult leader of 40% of Americans at this point. And this is that individual. And he, Because the, the crazy thing is, look, so other people, like you were referencing George Bush. George Bush got in his uh, aviator outfit or whatever. You know, like, we know he's not flying jet fighters. Come on, what are we talking about? But he's not that dumb. But he does it in a way where it's plausibly, okay, you're showing the flag colors, right? Yeah. But this is like this whole level, like you're saying, it's a fourth grader's understanding of how to no, do he, propaganda. No, no, don't put down fourth graders. Okay, sorry. He, he's, he's the dumb, <laughs> insecure fourth grader in the right. back row. Because there is a way in which it's still, you know, nauseating where you can totally do propaganda, right? He can be there and say, you know, thanks to the investments my administration made into science for this government and we saved because yeah, Obama yeah. had destroyed the infrastructure. Like, like we've been saying, right. I would have been okay. I would have still smirked a little bit. Right. 
I would have been totally fine if he would have takes credit if he would have bragged about yeah. braggable things. Right. Even if like again, I don't want him to do this, but I'm saying the more kind of like business as usual is like, you know, when I arrived here, Obama had basically fired all the scientists and I hired them all back and but fine, lie. Yeah. But this is so obscenely ridiculous. Yeah. This is him going This is distorted thinking. Like <laughs> this is this is when you start wondering about a personality, a characterological yeah. disorder. We don't yeah. know. I'm not diagnosing it's from afar. Literally but these scientists told me that I am so smart and they're so surprised yeah. about how much I understand. Yeah. Oh god. Because the Eddie even the most hell bent p- politician ideological politician well you know alex jones is actually smarter than 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 donald trump in that i don't know about alex jones but the 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 next worst politician would probably calculate "Mm, you know i should probably be careful about exactly what i say because history will show whether i am right now or not so i should probably hedge my bet a little bit trump repeatedly just puts his money down on a particular reality that no one in his circle believes and definitely never happened and then six months later he's like I never said those things. You, and, you weren't yeah. far from the analogy, like when when Kanye West, when Ye, whatever his name is, went on Alex Jones, and even Alex Jones is uh, self aware enough to go, whoa, 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 no, no, Nazis still bad, right, right. So it's similar to that where there's where, a line where at least yeah, those at, other people, get, where they at least their their <laughs> self preservation kicks in right. with with Trump. He doesn't have. That's what a characterological disorder is. Right. Your you don't even do things that are in, in your, your best interest because right. so there's so many other ways that he could have prevailed <laughs> and been reelected right. and come across as the genius that he thinks he is. He just kept shooting himself in the foot. Anyway, let's take a break. Let's get off of the Trump thing <laughs> and let's go to the Italy shutdown after the break. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. So Berto, I'm looking at my notes. I'm on page five of 47. <laughs> And we're at the uh, at the end of chapter two. <laughs> we could each individually spend twenty weeks straight, day and night, not sleeping, talking about this topic. Yeah, clearly, and I, not get through it. Yeah, I knew this going into it because it felt this way as I was obsessing on this topic this past couple of weeks. This is therapeutic for me. Yeah, because there's so much to get off my chest. I've already probably said everything I'm saying right now a thousand times anyway, but so many things happened and. So much was at stake, and there was so much terror, and there was so much yeah. death, and there was so much anger and injustice, yeah. which we'll get into later. But and there's so makes, much that I, I feel like I just have to yammer about it. Well, and this makes it real in a way, too, because like we were saying earlier how a lot of this felt like a dream or felt distant. Yeah. Um, having this, because you know, even though it's just the two of us, it's, it's validating. It's like, okay, right, so I didn't imagine all of this. Right. We went through this. Right. This is crazy. So... This might be fifteen chapters. I don't. I don't <laughs> we know. We might never do any more podcasts other than these. <laughs> well, also, I combed all my documents for emails relevant to the pandemic topic, and we, of course, had many emails. Yeah. So, at the end of this, I want to yeah. get into that. So, okay. So, March nine, Italy shuts down. A listener actually emailed us from Italy, and I remember reading the email, and she was like or maybe DM'd me or something. She's like, can you talk about what's happening in Italy right now? Because mm. it's, it's, it's really scary. They're, they're telling us that we can't leave our house and yeah. we don't know what the future holds. Can we go to work? Is everyone going to die? It's really scary. And then you had these videos, these funny videos of politicians in Italy, like yelling at everyone. Do you remember this? Yes. Like oh, saying, yes. you, like people, like Italian public officials yeah. going, fucking idiots in, in yeah. Italian. Uh, you idiots stay home or yeah. you will die yeah if you leave your house we will hunt you down yes. and deal with you <laughs> i will i will personally punch your lights out if you leave your i mean these really over the top videos but because it was an italian it sounded like an opera <laughs> yeah and so uh but anyway yeah so a listener emailed in and i think we might have even talked about it on the podcast briefly but it it sounded otherworldly i mean they were in dire straits of, co- of course wuhan china was already going through this but somehow hearing about you know it's wrong but even though i'm half asian hearing someone from italy 
it definitely Tell, feels closer. It feels to, closer to home. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and then you're seeing the news, like they're running out of hospital beds. Now they're the crematorium. is like the whole thing. You're like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. And at this point, I still am not thinking it's going to happen to us. Yeah. I'm, I still don't think that we're going to have an, an actual shutdown. Things are slowing down. People like Amazon workers and Microsoft work, people that can yeah. work at home are working from home. But- but only because they can. Only because they can. It's just like a weeks, suggestion. And it's two weeks. It's just two weeks. Just a couple remember? weeks. Yeah. It was a two-week shutdown. And yeah, exactly. And I remember absolutely believing, especially when we actually did shut down, that like, well, yeah. I mean, you give it two weeks. It, Let it, it die. It, 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 it dies weeks, out. Everyone, you know, if you have it, in two weeks, you're done. You're, you're dead so, or done. Yeah. And then it's over, right? So at this point, I'm like, we're not going to shut down. That's impossible. Now, I, at this point should have taught in person, but like you decided against it. So yeah. the rest of the university was still in person, but I was like, um, now your, your normal paranoia sets in. <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually my, my notes were a little wonky. So I held my classes over zoom on March 9th. Okay. But it wasn't a week, a week later was when Antioch as a whole went over zoom. And I remember, uh, e I remember feeling a little goofy. Mm. I was emailing all my students saying, I even think, I think one student might have emailed me and said, like, I don't feel comfortable. Are we safe going? Are we safe mm. going to class? And since I'm more on the edge of, yeah. uh, of the spectrum of, of being worried, I used that as an excuse. I think I said, if I remember my memory, I could look in the archives of my email, but I think I said something like, yeah, there's been some, there's been a lot of concern. <laughs> I'm sort of including my own concern in there. And so we're going to hold it over Zoom. And I remember a couple other students reached out to me and said, oh, thanks, because I, I was also kind of worried about things. Oh, but it wasn't, wow. but I don't think, I think most of the students were like, we're still in the, we're like, oh, okay, well, I guess class is over Zoom now. And and by the way, so you are saying that was March 9th. Nine. Nine. That was a Tuesday. So that weekend, right before that, the, the weekend of the 7th, that was our last trip as a family. We went to uh, Seattle to the Burke Museum. Mm. And I remember being very worried mm -hmm. because now it's, you know, now I'm like completely. I'm surprised that you even did it. Because the, the reason we did it is because uh, we thought, well, uh, there's, not a we lot, actually, there's not a lot of people. We may not be able to do any more outings for a while. Oh. We had already promised it to the kids. And say, yeah, it was like, well, the museum's not going to be packed. We also didn't go out at like a peak time or something. So we went. But I was both, actually both my wife and I, because my wife was fully converted by then. We were both like, should we be doing this? I mean, at this point, her job is still in person with yes. a lot of people. Yes. And she's a, exposed all day long. But to, they're about to they're about to not be. But she doesn't know that at the, the Yeah, time. we don't know that yet. I've already started working from home because I can. Like, were you, were you worried about even being affected by your wife? Oh, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Were you keeping her at a 10-foot at a uh, pole? No, but masking was happening. Oh, in, in the house? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So March 9, yeah. the four of you are masking up. Yeah. And when we went, we were masked. Interesting. So we're in, in the Burke Museum with masks. Interesting. They're not in 95s. Did you see masks. anyone else in masks? Maybe. I don't quite remember. So let's do a little side thing about the culture of masks because yeah. in East Asia, which is the majority of the population of the world, especially when you include South Asia, masks are commonplace and have been totally. for, for 20 years. And, and by the way, for years, I looked at those pictures and I laughed. I'm like, what are those weirdos? What yeah. are they doing? Yeah. How crazy. Or occasionally you'd see a, an East Asian in public in Seattle wearing a mask. And I'm like, they're so paranoid. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I landed, but I certainly wasn't uh, jump. I w and it's hard to relate. Because I was very uh, xenophobic about it. Like, oh, really? Not that's maybe too extreme, but I always thought it was weird and unnecessary. Yeah. Like, I, why are they doing that? I was a little partial to it, but I, I would I would have to admit that I was probably 90 percent in your camp, which is like, I think you're overly paranoid yeah. there. And of course, for them, they have dealt well they have a bad air quality and constant waves of disease <laughs> right and, and also yeah. less self-centeredness around those kinds of issues yeah. more science-based adherence or something and they're all packed super tightly in those cities yeah you know so th they've 
had a culture of like, yeah, you wear a mask, no big yeah. deal. And even for you and I who are hypochondriac yeah. in a leaning, right? before the pandemic, wearing a mask was ridiculous. Unheard of. So that day at the Berkeley Museum, you know? I felt really weird. Yeah. Wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah. But good for you that, you know, it could have saved you. But honestly. that was the last thing we did mm. for the for a very long time. Yeah, for months. And when you think about it, my kid, my little kid was four at the time. Yeah. And so at God, that So age, tell me about that. So tell me like what what difference, particularly for the four-year-old? Well, I guess both. It's honestly, so sad, man. I mean, I think particularly for the four-year-old because that's such a that's such a. Although I don't know, I could see it going either way because I could see isolation at four. No, no, not this, being great. No, this had a huge impact. Look, I'll say the following. Number one, so there was a very big positive, which was I got to spend more time with my kids than any parent in modern times history. I'm not saying just me. I mean, parents that got to stay home. Yeah, yeah. Because before this, even though I am someone who makes time and I do, you know, I, I'm not like, okay, I'll see the kids, yeah. just kiss them good night. No, no, I spend time with them. Yeah. But come on, I'm at work. They're at school. Weekends, you're tired, so you do a couple activities. Yeah, this was different. Yeah, so just an asterisk to this of Stacy and I were able to spend 10 times more time together yeah. with this, which was definitely a pro yeah and, and no commute uh definitely a pro it's it, you get so close like oh that's the other thing me and my wife same thing where where we realized oh my gosh we have spent so much time together now mm -hmm. now so all those are positives because just the contrast with your yeah. life in, in the past and, and mine as well yeah you know monday morning it, <laughs> you get up I and don't see her usually because she leaves before I'm even Even off. if you see your family, yeah. it's just like high by. You, you, you commute. Yeah. You're, maybe you work nine, ten hours. Yeah. You commute home. You got to get all your crap together. You got to get the kids ready for dinner. And you're, everyone's running around. You eat yeah. dinner. You clean up. And it's almost time for bedtime. It's almost time for bed. <laughs> yeah. and, and on the weekends, you're doing errands. Yeah. And so when do you have time to just hang with the yeah. kids? Just like hang time. Maybe a Sunday every other week or an outing or a trip you go on. Whereas literally every day. Every day, all hours of the day. <laughs> I mean, even day. when I'm working. They're still walking by. They're coming yeah. by. Oftentimes, my little one would sit on my lap while I was in meetings. Yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah. I would, Stacy and I working at home, we would take a break. I you know, it, normally when you're in the office, you take a break. You chat with an yeah. office mate, or you walk down the street or something. But you take a break at home. You do that with your family. You, you interact. You interact with right. your family. So those were all amazing positives. Yeah. Another weird positive for both myself and my kids and stuff was how much time we actually spent in the house. Because again, you think, well, you live in the place. But if you work in modern times, you're out of the house a lot. And on the weekends, you're traveling, you're going and stuff. Yeah, like and that. so I think, to put a fine point on it, is I think it illuminated just how fucked up our lives were, were, <laughs> were normally. Yeah. Because that's fucked up. Yeah. That that it was culturally normal <laughs> yes. to never see your family. Never see your family Barely enjoy the things you have. Yeah, totally. Now, here's the toll that I noticed. So before the pandemic, I had these daddy-daughter days that I would take my my daughters with. When my, my old, eldest was an only child before we had the second one, dude, that was a highlight for me and for her, right? It was like, we'd have these trips to Seattle and we'd go, okay, today we're going to the Space Needle. Or some other time it was like, we're gonna go to the to the Berg Museum or we're gonna go to the EMP or we're gonna go to the Flight Museum. They were big deals. And sometimes they were family trips, all, all of us, or sometimes it was just daddy, daughter. Meaning just one of your daughters. Right, and then when my second daughter was born, I would do both, I would like alternate and sometimes do both daughters and then sometimes it was all four of us and it was great. Yeah. We took her to zoos, the aquarium, like all these things. We had memberships, all that. The pandemic hits, all that goes away. And my little four-year-old at the time didn't get so many of those. Now, again, we're spending more time together, so that's good. But we're not doing these little outings and these things. Now, the, the she second- She feels like she's ripped off. Yeah. And I feel, in a way, like- Short it also is. short. And, but, and your older one's entering into a phase where she's a little less concerned. Right, about and she starts seeking more independence. She's more about her friends. And the second thing that, that has been weird, especially with the little one, 
and it's getting a little better, but it's taken like a year. She got so homebound that she didn't want to go anywhere. So then we're like, oh, we're going on a trip. I don't want to go. I just want to be home. They're like, oh, we're going to go visit Nana. We haven't seen her in months. I don't want to go. Yeah, usually at that age, right. they're like, yay. You're going to spend a couple nights at Nana's because daddy and mommy are like, no, tears, like freaking out. Whereas with our eldest, we used to drop her off for a week at Nana's. This was a big difference. Yeah. And again, even till now. Well, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, you and I were terrified. Imagine being that age without the ability to control your life, without any emotional regulation skills that you hopefully will get at some point. Yeah. The amount of terror and trauma yeah. of watching society and your parents and yourself in a constant state of danger. And that she doesn't really remember before that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like three years old. Yeah. Like that she has teeny little memories. So the majority of her memories of being little is like, well, yeah, it's a pandemic and I'm at home. And I'm in extreme <laughs> and danger, danger. And there's danger. And daddy can't protect me. Yeah, dude. I think that trauma. I can't imagine. It's crazy. So it is scary to think what's going to happen to a lot of that generation yeah. without enough therapy and all these things. Yeah. Anyway, so that is. And been things a were already getting. That's the other thing is like this compounded a trend that was already happening which was increased anxiety increased depression increased suicidality increased isolation yeah increased uh, worries of transmissible diseases this kind of thing uh, fewer connections uh, fewer support more staying at home more video games more computer time more screen time it it was already heading that direction for a good 20 years and the pandemic <laughs> just put like 10 final nails in that. Yeah. Coffin. This one was down to 11 final nails. <laughs> so have you, so what about the older one? Cause the older one I'm guessing would have been much more friend oriented at that point And thus for a while, couldn't see your friends. Right. Yeah, that's but, good, but you had your neighbors goal. that you were in a pod with, right? Well, yes, although there were there was periods of time where we couldn't yeah. because we were both very paranoid. Then what we started allowing is masked outside play. So the, the neighbors, we didn't go in each other's houses for like a year and a half, right? I mean, from, from March of 2020 till end of 2021. No, what am I talking about? I think it was 2022 when we finally went in each other's houses. Hmm. So that was bizarre too. Even so, though you're all vaccinated. Yeah. I guess the kids weren't yeah. vaccinated yet. No, well, you're right. That yeah. was kids well, weren't allowed to be vaccinated. That's why. That's why we couldn't yes. So it was until twenty twenty two when the kids were vaccinated that finally we went back in each other's houses and yeah. not like all the time. Yeah. So think about that, right? Like so you have so these things friends. still haven't returned to normal. Now it's fine. Like we had well. It's mostly fine. Like we had our New Year's party, people were over, no one was masking. It was great times. Okay. I mean, obviously everyone's still kind of, there is, ah, no, that's not even true. Some of our neighbors that we invited did, did wear masks the whole time. Now that I'm remembering. Now we'll say that I've talked with a lot of people, clients, students of mine, friends with younger kids and high school age kids who suffered greatly yeah the pain the anxiety the conflict you know one example that i ran into a fair amount with my students because you know I'd be teaching over zoom and yeah. the point is is there's a fair amount of years well so it would have from march 2020 yeah. until the last class i taught which was at the end of 2021 so for almost two years i was teaching online you know a fair amount of the students have kids naturally the students are at home and the kids are in the other room or are in the background and so there's a fair amount of you just notice things happening as a professor <laughs> and we would talk about it at, at yeah. times as well and there was a lot of different experiences but one of the themes was that you know a kid of a certain age really wants to hang out with their parents yep in the past the parents would go to work and the kid would go to daycare or go to grandma's. So or you had a natural separation. There's a separation there. There's yeah. not a. There's not an attractive nuisance. The yeah. kid, and I would observe this when my mom had a daycare at home. The kids would get dropped off, and the and the kids, as the parents are leaving, would be upset. 
but give the kid five minutes yeah. and the, the kid is fine. The parents walk in the door and the kid breaks down again. Yeah. But there's this, there's an eight hour gap there where the kid is emotionally fine because yeah. they can't see the parents <laughs> not being with them. You yeah, know? Yeah. Whereas over Zoom class, the kids w- would know on the other side of the bedroom door is my mommy and she is not only right there, but she's actively rejecting me oh. <laughs> for three or four hours. You know what yeah. I mean? She's telling me she doesn't want me in the room oh, with her, you know? Right, right. That's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. And you would have kids. And, if, of and course, as a little kid, even though you could be explained why, yeah. you don't get it. No. Uh, four-year-olds are not rational human beings. No, no, no. Uh, even eight-year-olds have a tough time with that. Even in, with a 12-year-old who rationally understands it it still hurts right so it was um it was really rough on so and then you have potentially some kids that are special needs it gets even harder right oh my so gosh, yeah. i would see these and i would feel terrible because you know i'm i'm requiring attendance from these yeah. students you know and of course we would get flexible at times and if a student was like i gotta deal with uh, you know because they would be yeah. on mute so i wouldn't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> and they would unmute themselves and be like, like I'm so sorry, my, and then all of a sudden you hear this kid just screaming off camera and the, <laughs> the student would be like, yeah, I'm having an issue. So I'm terribly sorry. And I would always a hundred percent just be yeah. like, do what you got to do. Cause times yeah, yeah. are weird right now. You know, I mean, this happened to me frequently where I was in a meeting, a serious meeting where I might even be talking. It might be a tense meeting. And all of a sudden my four year old pops in and everyone was very understanding. She sits on my lap you know, she had to be quiet, but she could be with me. And I, I usually made it a point to still be receptive to that. But I didn't even think about the fact that if she were two, that would be even harder because now she's not quiet, right? Or and one, you're telling or, her to be quiet. And you're like, quiet. Or no, now I can't have you. And you're right. It's like rejection, yeah. rejection, rejection. The other thing that helped is basically my wife took a time break from working and she was basically my four-year-old's teacher. You know, she was just like teaching her preschool stuff, right? So they got to spend a lot of time together, which is great and also made it difficult when she went back to school when my four-year-old, when my then five and then six, yeah, whenever five, I don't remember what age she went back to school, but because it's like she had had mommy teacher. Right. And now it's like, wait, so that was hard too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now- on the other hand, what's the alternative? You never see your kid at all and your kid forgets you exist? You know, I don't know. So I, I feel like... I feel There's like a balance somewhere. Yeah, because, you know, the alternative is like, well, you you make sure you always work in the office and never yeah. see your kid all day. Uh, yeah, I just feel like it really illuminated a lot of things, the pandemic. The fact yeah. that we never see our family members, I think, was the fact that it just, be, it just becomes common, normal. Yeah. That like, well, yeah, of course, you have a nine to five, Monday through Friday. Uh, you see your family frantically while you're in a frenzy of activity from... 6 30 to 8 30 and then you fall asleep in front of, front of the tv <laughs> and then yeah you do chores all day on saturday and maybe you see your kids kind of and then sunday you, you might have an outing or you might actually be spending time with your friends or that you know so that was just normal life and so this illuminated that the other thing it illuminated was just how stupid we are about having to work in offices there yeah. was so much and i've been railing about this <laughs> for a long time because when I worked at the university, when I started working there full time, because I've always, you know, I've mainly worked at home as a self-employed person. Right. But when I became a full-time person at the university in the aughts, my home was literally across the street from the university. Uh. So I would go home. I had my own office as a professor at the university, mm-hmm. but I, I, I preferred being home. And yeah. I found that the the energy level I had and the mood I was in and the productivity that I could achieve while at home was far greater than oh, what I was in the office. I am so efficient at home. Yeah. With when it comes to work stuff. Because people it, don't interrupt you yeah, with it's like crazy. who has a case of the Mondays. No, 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 no. It is so efficient. In other words, the and the, the downside is I actually it's true, I don't socialize much with my coworkers. That is true. But I don't I don't know if that maybe it turns out that that's not a must have. It's not a must. It's a bummer. That is a loss. Yeah. And I do lament that. I do. I, I, if you would have asked me, and maybe I even thought this, is that a tremendous loss at the time? I'd say no. But after it 
being gone from my life for so long, it does bum me out. It feels good to have even at those little dumb small talky interactions with people, especially over the long term. I will I will say that so one of the people that works in 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 my group, uh, she sets up um, biweekly or monthly. I can't remember, but it's a regular. Uh, two-hour block of time where we just play games like over Zoom, over over Zoom. Yeah, like we just play. Yeah, and does that does that get that? Fixed? It, well, it it definitely is awesome. It is good. We we have fun. There's no work talk at all. We literally just play, and so I do get to know people a little better that way. I it it doesn't replace it in that I have not made any friends like no now we're friends. Other than there's there's one person that actually you've met. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but. But the but at the same as I say that I'm also at a different place in my life where right. when I was younger all my friends came from work or school. Now I don't have time to make that many new friends. Yeah, I kind of feel like <laughs> this is another thing that I thought about when I was prepping was that the pandemic accelerated or pushed me into my age or something <laughs> because even at the age of forty nine yeah. when the pandemic started I was still kind of behaving like I was in my 30s or 20s, yeah, yeah. my lifestyle. Right. <laughs> going to clubs, going to live music, uh, still having the same vibe with friends and activities and yeah. parties and socializing and chaotic life. And the pandemic made me my age <laughs> <laughs> or accelerate or push me past or something yeah. where now I'm I'm like – why would I want to leave the house when, <laughs> when there are, when people are out there, you know what I mean? And, and that's not age, but it, it is, it, it's, I'm a much more stable person now. There's a pros and cons, I guess yeah, is the yeah. thing, you know, like a, a different focus, a different priority set, right. if you will. But anyway, um, let's adjourn there chapter two. And when we pick up on chapter three, I think with chapter two, Berto, we made it one week of into the uh, of of my or maybe 10 days of my of timeline. my of my timeline great. so that's great uh that that's that's quite an accomplishment yes and when we <laughs> tune in next time when we continue with chapter three in which we start with march 10 <laughs> and everyone out there please take care of yourself because you deserve it